Uh, thank you, Lisa. I don't know if I can live up to all of that, but uh, it was a very nice introduction. And I want to thank you and, and Eric Ward for uh, the invitation to be able to come here and talk with people and talk a little bit about the work and a little bit about GFP. And uh, something about how I think science may actually really be done as opposed to the way we somehow are always taught about science when we, at least when I was in elementary school and in high school, we were taught that scientists did things in a particular way. There was this thing called the scientific method, where you thought of the idea, you figured out what you were going to do to answer the problem, did the experiment in an afternoon, and fame and good fortune came immediately to you. Um, that doesn't always happen. I'll try to show how <laughs> many of those fallacies actually uh, really don't uh, hold up to the light of actual experimentation. But anyway, I want to explain my title a bit here, especially since I heard that Kerry Mullis earlier in this series uh, talked a lot about translational research. So maybe some of you know what this is. Translational research is a, a catchword that uh, we hear a lot, especially at medical schools, and we also hear it a lot in Washington, uh, that we should take the observations, the things that we have learned from basic research, and apply them to produce cures and to produce uh, treatments for human disease. Now, as I get older and older, I think this is a terrific idea, so I'm not going to argue against it. On the other hand, the problem really can be seen in the fact that when the, the stimulus money came to NIH, the very first thing that the National Institutes of Health did was to say we'll have 100 challenge grants, 100 different topics that we would like to see solved. And 98 of the 100 were translational. Only two were basic research. I'm not against translational research, but I think the proportion is completely wrong. And as many people have said in the past, you need to have something to translate in order to have translational research. And just yesterday, I even heard of an even better quote, which was uh, from Benjamin Franklin, and then stolen by Michael Faraday, who said, uh, on seeing in France the first hot air balloon, somebody said, what's going to be the use of that? And Franklin apparently turned to him and said, what's the use of a newborn baby? So I'll let you think about that. But I'll also show you another example of how really pernicious all of this is. Uh, I'm from New York City, so I, it's obligatory to read the New York Times, and every once in a while it really incenses me. And here is one example from last November. Nicholas Wade says that there's rare hits and heaps of misses to pay for for basic research, that NIH uh, basic research, the attempt to understand fundamental personal is so risky, in fact, that only the federal government is willing to keep pouring money into it. It is a venture that produces far fewer hits than misses. And then as you read the column, what you find is that what he means is, uh, did, it per did it make money or did it actually cure a disease? Not was something learned. Um, so it's a very strange definition and they somehow keep letting him publish. Um, I don't know why that is. Anyway, I want to talk about the story of green fluorescent protein. And before actually introducing green fluorescent protein, I have to tell you just a little bit about uh, why it was something that attracted me when I first heard about it. I was not working on bioluminescence or fluorescence or anything like that. I was trying, and still continue to try to understand, a very basic problem in sensory biology. Biologists have a really good idea of the molecules that are needed that allow us to see. We've known about the molecule rhodopsin that's in our retinas for about 126 years. And in the last 20, 25 years, we've learned about the molecules that allow us to detect chemical signals, whether those signals are external, smells and tastes, or whether they're signals inside our body, hormones, neurotransmitters. We know what the molecules are that detect those chemical signals. But we have a lot of senses that don't work by chemicals or by light. Uh, they work because cells are pushed around, basically. They're mechanically stimulated. These include our sense of hearing, balance, 
detection of blood pressure. We have at least five different senses of touch in our skin, five different types of cells that detect that. We have lots of different senses. We send people up into space, and one of the real problems with prolonged space flight is that their bones fall apart because they're no longer feeling the pressure of gravity on the bones, which is, has to be there. Even on Earth, you, this affects our bones. If you're a tennis player, the arm that you've probably been playing tennis with for years is a lot stronger. The bones are a lot stronger than the other arm because of all the forces that have been exerted on the, on the bone and the reaction from them. One final one, just to add it to the group. I would say that virtually everyone in this room, probably everyone in this room, has their heart on their left side and their liver on their right side. But the reason for that is that when we were all extremely tiny embryos, there were some cells that felt a flow of fluid across them. And as they felt that flow of fluid across them, that set up all the gene expression so the heart was made in the particular place that it was and all the other things slotted in after that. There are some individuals with a rare condition in which those cells don't function. As a result, because you have to put the heart somewhere, half of those individuals have their hearts on the correct side, the left side, and everything else looks like the rest of us. But the other half, the heart gets put on the right side and everything slots in, and so they're mirror images of the rest of us only because a mechanical signal was not detected. Now, all of these sense, senses have one thing in common. We have absolutely no idea how they work. So this means by my studying this, I'm in business for quite a while. <laughs> and what I use to study this is I use genetics, and I study it in a very tiny worm that as an adult is only a 25th of an inch long. It's a millimeter. This is a picture of the worm. I'd been working on this worm since, I've, I've been working on it since 1977 when I started my postdoc. And everyone's, there are things we know about this animal we don't know about that it's really unique. So for example, we know that this animal has precisely 302 nerve cells. That's its nervous system. We actually know every cell division from the fertilized egg all the way to the adult. We know what every nerve cell looks like. It's the only animal we have the whole wiring of all of its nervous system. It was the first animal to have all its DNA sequenced. Uh, it's been a really good friend over the years. And it has one property that's very nice and which I talked about in almost every seminar I ever gave for the first 10 or 12 years that I worked on this animal, and that is that the animal is transparent. So that you can actually look inside the animal and you can see individual cells in the microscope right through the animal. But you can't tell where those cells are, or which cell is doing what here, and neither can I. And at the time we were getting mutants that were insensitive to touch. Once you get a mutant, you can try to clone the gene. We were cloning the genes. And then the first question we want to ask ourselves is, what cell turns on these genes? Is it in the nerve cell that we think is responsible for sensing touch, or is it in some other cell? Where is the gene active? At the time, which is about 1988, 1989, there were a number of methods that people could use to find out where genes were being turned on. We know that the DNA encodes RNA, which then makes a protein. We know we can make antibodies against the protein. And so if we have an antibody against the protein, any place the protein is made, we'll be able to see it. It's a little hard, I think, in this picture, but I hope you can see that there's some red here. And these are the cells that express, the touch sensing cells, in fact, that are expressing a particular protein. Another way to tell whether a gene is active is you can, genes have two parts. There's the first part, which says, or one part that says, this is what should be made, the protein. The other part is the control region, saying how much, where, and when. And so if you take that control part and you now have it make not the normal protein, but another protein that you can see, uh, you can actually look. So an enzyme, for example, you can see again, every cell that has the gene active. Or finally, because DNA gets translated, or transcribed rather, into RNA, you can use probes to see where the RNA is. This is a process called in situ hybridization. And again, you can see the specific cells that 
have the RNA made in them. So at the time we were doing our experiments, there were methods that allowed us to answer the question, where is the gene turned on? The problem, of course, is that all of these methods were rather cumbersome. They took a long time, a couple, several days to do, and even worse, it's what we had to do to be able to see them. We had to fix the animals, meaning they had to be dead and preserved in a way so that nothing moved around. I mean, there's nothing worse than having something where the, everything is sort of mushed itself up. So we needed to fix the animals, and then we needed to get the antibody into the preparation, or the substrate for the enzyme, or the probe for the in situ hybridization. So we had to permeabilize, poke holes in these animals so we could get the stuff in. This is a rather drastic thing to do to this, but even more than that, because these are all dead, fixed preparations, this gives us a very static view of life. It's not telling us what's happening over time, it's just telling us at the moment we prepare the sample. But it will give you the answer. But we needed some inspiration for something a little bit better, and, this, and I can tell you that suddenly inspiration struck. I have a very nice example of inspiration, if you need any, which is this wonderful uh, Nick Kim cartoon, Cambridge 1953, shortly before discovering the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick, depressed by their lack of progress, visit the local pub, I'll have a double Felix. <laughs> Now, my inspiration didn't come in a pub. It came on a, little, a couple minutes after noon on April 25th, 1989. And I know this because I kept notes of this. And it was a seminar I heard. And in the seminar, the speaker, a man named Paul Brem, talked about the work of this man, Osama Shimamura, and the work he had done with this jellyfish, Aquaria Victoria. Osama Shimamura shared the prize with me, and I would strongly recommend, if you have a half an hour to spend, actually you only need 29 minutes, he got his talk in under the time, unlike the rest of us. Uh, his talk on the NobelPrize.org website is really amazing. This is an astonishing individual. At the age of 16, he's told, you have to quit school. You have to leave now, you have to go work in a factory, and we're telling you which factory you have to work in. You have to go across the mountains, outside of the city. You have to go over the mountains into the adjacent valley. There's a factory there we want you to work at, which he did, which turned out to actually be pretty good because the city was Nagasaki. It was 1945, and by being in the adjacent valley, he was protected when the atomic bomb went off. He went in the next days and rescued people and took care of people. But of course, the university he wanted to go to was completely destroyed. Uh, eventually, they built the pharmacy school near to where he was living, and he was able to go to that for his undergraduate work. Eventually, did make it to graduate school in Nagoya University, and did a, a wonderful biochemical project, which led, which was a project trying to understand the biochemistry of, again, a very fundamental problem, definitely not a translational research problem. He wanted to understand how a certain crustacean called Cypridina could generate light. Now, there are many organisms that generate light, fireflies, glowworms, uh, these crustaceans, there's some fungi, bacteria, this jellyfish here, Aquaria victoria, all are capable of producing light and one of the fundamental problems that biologists, biochemists have wanted to know is, how do they do that? How is light generated chemically or biochemically in these organisms? And he was able to solve this problem with Cypridina, and that got him an invitation to come to the United States to work with a man named Frank Johnston at Princeton, who brought him to Friday Harbor Lab in Washington State and said, um, I think we should study how this jellyfish produces light. Now, I should tell you this picture here is completely falsely colored. The jellyfish only produces light in just this area here, and the light that's produced is green. It's not blue. So this is a horrible picture, OK? That, that's, this is what I have. So this is what you get. So uh, there was some sort of falling out between the two of them, and Frank Johnson decided he would work on something else. Osama is a guy who just never gives up. He just started doing the experiments and isolating, got a lot of jellyfish, isolated this ring of tissue that had the light-producing cells in it, and 
ground it up, tried to make a, a suspension to be able to purify the protein that generated light. And he did this over and over and over and over again, and he failed every time. He then had an idea about what to change, and he's got slightly better results, but not really. One day, he goes, he's been working late at night, it's summer, it's already dark out, he has had another failure. He takes the prep, it's no use keeping it, it hasn't worked once again, he throws it in the sink. The sink has jellyfish parts, some seawater, a bunch of stuff in it. He turns off the light, he's just about to leave, and he happens to glance back at the sink, and it's glowing brightly. <laughs> he thinks about it for a while and realizes that the seawater in the sink had calcium in it. So the next time he does the experiment, he adds calcium, and it produces the light. I want to point out that this is a very typical scientific method. Some people throw their preps on the floor, some in the sink. Sometimes it works. It's not the scientific method. Um, in any case, what he was able to show was that a protein that he named after the jellyfish and called a corin, that when that was present with calcium, that a blue light was produced. But as I've already told you, the jellyfish are not blue, they're green. And so he immediately was confronted with a problem that he didn't even realize he had until it basically hit him in the face, and that was, I've got the wrong color. <laughs> so he went to decide on why, he thought about it a while, and he took a handheld ultraviolet light, and he went to all of his samples again, and found that one of them, when it shown, you shown ultraviolet or blue light on the sample, it gave green light back. He called this protein the green protein. We call it the green fluorescent protein. Fluorescence is when a, a molecule absorbs energy of one wavelength and then gives off light of another wavelength. And so uh, now a corn plus calcium plus GFP gives a green light. So you could explain the green light. And this was, this was his, the work that got him the Nobel Prize. And the part about GFP is a footnote. Pretty good work to be able to do that. So I'm listening there in this seminar, and I'm saying to myself, I work on a transparent animal, and I want to know where the genes are turned on. If we could get the genes to turn on this thing, all we'd have to do is shine blue light, and we would see exactly where they are. I heard about this at the beginning of the seminar. I then went into a long period of fantasizing about what we would do. I have no idea what the person talked about for the whole rest of the <laughs> seminar. But the next day, I was able to get in touch with this man, Douglas Prasher, who was in the process of cloning the DNA for the green fluorescent protein gene. And we had a wonderful talk, and we decided we were going to collaborate, and then we had a bunch of problems. One of the problems was I got married, and when I got married, my wife at the time, uh, still my wife, but at the time, my wife had gone to, uh, it was at the University of Utah. We just got married. I decided to do my sabbatical with her, so I went to her lab. That's exactly when Douglas finished the cloning. He tried to call me. He couldn't find me. He decided I had dropped out of science. And since he never called me, I decided that he was too embarrassed to talk to me to say that it didn't work. So for three years, we didn't know that <laughs> we both were still interested in this and that it had worked. But fortunately, in, in September of, of uh, 1992, I got a new graduate student, Gia Skirkin. I should explain something about the color code here. You can see Gia's name is in red. Everybody from my lab, their name is going to be in red. Everybody whose name is in blue is a collaborator, and you will see a couple of people whose names are in black. They did something I wish I had done, okay? <laughs> so Gia had already gotten a master's degree in our chemical engineering department at Columbia, and she had worked on fluorescence. So I told her about this idea that I had, and I said, ah, but the guy hasn't called me, but we should go down, we should look online because the university just gave us this wonderful med line. We could look up things. And we look it up, and the very first journal article that comes up is Douglas's paper where he had cloned the gene. We ran down to the library, 
got the journal out of the, the library, looked at it, had a, something unbelievably miraculous in it. It's not in most scientific articles. It had his phone number. So we called him up, we renewed the collaboration, and he sent the DNA to us within a matter of days. And one month after Gia had entered graduate school, she, this is a page from her lab notebook and a picture she took on that very first day, she was able to show that if she put the GFP gene into bacteria, that it was going to work on its own. We could have green fluorescing, it says fluorescing E. coli, and then the word strongly here. So we knew it worked immediately. There's another thing I want to point out about her lab notebook here, and that is this part here. It says, use the scope from the lab she had worked in in engineering. The reason for this is she had looked at our microscope, but our microscope was a piece of junk. And she thought it worked, but she wasn't sure, so she said, but I know where there's a good microscope. And she went to her old lab, and she was able to confirm it, and that's where this picture was taken. But then we had a problem. We had made this wonderful discovery. We wanted to do more studies. We couldn't just publish her page from the lab notebook. And we didn't have a microscope. Um, so there's going to be a little bit here about how to do science. Um, I called up all the representatives that of the various microscope companies, and I said we had just developed a completely new method that used fluorescence, and uh, we were thinking of buying a microscope, and we'd like them to bring a loaner by, and if they could leave it for a couple of months, we would be perfectly happy, and that's what they did. So uh, we did everything on borrowed microscopes for the paper. Uh, but let me tell you why her experiment was really so important and, and so unusual. People knew when we started doing the work, that GFP did not need to have any other extra bit of vitamin or a small molecule. It didn't need to have anything extra. But it did need to have one special modification. You know that polypeptides, proteins, are long chains of amino acids. So it's just like a line where all these little bits are added in. Well, GFP does some, it has something rather remarkable that happens with that. So here is that part of that line going here and on, and these different amino acid side groups coming off at various points. But here's the chain, the linear chain. But in GFP, the mature protein is modified, so part of this chain makes a five-membered ring. And this modification was something that no one had any idea how it was made. Did it require one em another enzyme, or two, or five, or ten? Everyone thought it was going to need something else, but it wasn't going to work on its own. Her experiment, where she just puts the DNA in and she gets a fluorescent product in the bacteria, says, uh-uh, it doesn't need anything else. All it needs is that protein itself. There was also another thing that was, we were exceptionally lucky. The clone that we got is diagrammed here. You don't have to read any of the letters. Just know that the part that actually encodes the instructions for GFP is all here in green, diagrammed here in green. And then there were some extra bits from the DNA from the jellyfish. Now, at the time, most people, whenever they wanted to clone something, they would use an enzyme that would cut out a piece of DNA and then put it in somewhere else. One of those enzymes is called EcoR1, and so the fragment that you get if you use the enzyme has both the green bits and the red bits. I didn't like that idea. I didn't want to have anything other than what really just was needed for the protein, and so I suggested to, to Gia that she take PCR primers, which if you were here at the last talk, you probably heard a lot about, and just amplify the green part and use that. I subsequently found out that three other groups tried this same experiment, except we were the only ones that used PCR and amplified just the green bit. They all used the enzyme and got the extra stuff, and there's something about the red stuff that poisons the whole thing. It doesn't work. So remember I said, if it doesn't work, you say, oh, there must be something else that's needed. I need another enzyme. So we were very fortunate. We happened to do the experiment in the particular way that we did. Well, this led finally to us putting it into the worms, and, uh, which was the goal for me to begin with, 
and we sent the paper out for publication. So I want to tell you a little bit about the problems of publication. We sent it to the journal Science, and as you can see here, it was published. It's a little hard to see that this is actually a whole worm here, and this is a growing cell coming out. Uh, but you may also know that the journal Science thinks very highly of itself. And the editors, in fact, you can't just send a paper in and they send it off to people to review and then they get their opinions and then they decide. The editors first meet uh, for a couple weeks and decide whether your per paper is worthy to be reviewed. And so they called me up, or I, I, somehow I, I, I was talking with them, and they, they said, we're not going to send your paper out. And I said, what's the problem? What's, what's wrong with the paper? And they said, we don't like your title. <laughs> I said, what? Uh, this was the title, which I thought was pretty snappy. Green fluorescent protein, a new marker for gene expression. And they said, well, we don't like the title because, you know, everything in the journal Science is new. So you can't use the word new in the title. <laughs> and we're not going to send it out with that title. And I said, well, OK, should I change the title? And they said, yes, that would be OK. And so. I do not like to be told what to do. So the title the reviewers got was a little bit long. The Aquaria Victoria green fluorescent protein needs no exogenously added component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. This is the entire paper, you know. Could have just published the title and that would have been it. And it got accepted, which was very nice. And then the copy editor called me up and said, you know, your title is a little long. And I said, we could shorten it. They said, yeah. And I said, okay. So the final title became Green Floor as a Marker for Gene Expression. And they published it. So that was the first problem. The second problem is here on the left-hand side, this cover picture for science. I was extremely excited about this because what this shows is a living animal, living worm that we studied, and here is a nerve cell in the process of growing out. And you're watching the growth cone, the growing end of the nerve cell as it's growing in the animal. We could see something in a living animal. I was pretty excited about this picture. And the, art, the cover art editor called me up and said, we really like your picture, but we have a problem. The problem is that there's one color we don't ever like to have on the cover of science because it reproduces so badly, and that's green. Can we change the color? I sort of stood my ground on that, but I have to say, this is an enhanced picture that I've put up here. It actually isn't a very nice picture on the cover. It's a little washed out. But in any case, I, I was able to stand my ground. The third problem we had with publication was the fact that we had already been giving away samples of GFP to lots of people who were already using it for their own experiments and getting successful results. And we wanted to be able to cite their work uh, to show that this was much more universal. And when we did that, uh, everything was, everyone was great except for one person who made a lot of demands. And that's this person. Dear Marty, it's perfectly fine with me if you cite S. Wang and my unpublished results in your science paper on GFP, provided you meet the following conditions. You make coffee each Saturday morning for the next two months, ready by 8.30 a.m. You prepare a special French dinner at the time of your choosing, and you empty the garbage nightly for the next month. <laughs> this is my wife. But what she did was actually spectacular. We showed that you could take the control part of the gene and you could turn GFP on, so whenever that control was working, you got GFP. What she did is she put GFP onto a protein, and she could follow wherever the protein went. It was like handing a flashlight to the protein and watching it go. And the particular protein that she works on is a protein that's made in these cells in fruit flies and Drosophila. These are called the nurse cells. They make a lot of different substances and then transport them into the developing oocyte, which is right here. They come to lie along this edge and along that edge. And she was able to watch that happen. She was also able to show that this fusion protein, part her protein, part GFP, could completely correct the defects in a mutant that had the protein. So the GFP wasn't interfering. And so she could say, I know what's supposed to happen here. It's what I'm seeing is, is important. Now, GFP has a lot of uh, 
advantages as a biological marker. First of all, we don't give the protein, we give the DNA to an organism, and that organism can be a plant, it can be an animal, it can be a bacterium, it can be anything. We give it the DNA, and it and all of its subsequent progeny will have that DNA and will be able to make, with the right controlling regions, will be able to make GFP. Looking at GFP is really easy. You shine blue light and you see green. This is a really terrific non-invasive way of studying biology. And so it doesn't hurt the organism at all. The molecule is also small and this advantage means that the, in, with large molecules, sometimes they're stuck in the cell body because they can't diffuse out of that. So you can't see what the cell looks like. But GFP is small enough to go everywhere in the cell, so you can see the entire outline of a cell. And, as I've said a couple times now, it can be seen in living cells and organisms. We can watch biology happen. We finally have a dynamic way of looking at life. Uh, the other thing to point out here is that GFP is itself probably the most wonderful molecule, I mean, beautiful molecule I, I know of. And yes, I'm sort of a proud papa on this, but the thing is, it's a lantern. And yeah, I know in the movies, Green Lantern is about to come out, but uh, this really is a Green Lantern. It's made up a whole bunch of these struts that make a can, which is capped at the top and the bottom, and there's an alpha helix that goes right up the middle, and that rearrangement occurs right there, and that's where the light is produced. So it really is, when you hang this on a protein, it's like hanging a lantern on that protein to follow it wherever it goes in the cell. And people have put it in a lot of different places. So here are some pictures of worms, flies, canola plants, mice, fish. This is Alba, the GFP bunny. Alba was commissioned from a French company by the Brazilian artist Eduardo Hack, who uh, lives in Chicago. And he wanted Alba, one, as a family pet, but also to be able to bring to his various art installations to get people talking about the connection between art and science and art and technology. Uh, Alba lived a nice, long life and died of natural causes, not by GFP. I've heard a rumor, I don't know if it's true, that he might have a GFP puppy now, but I don't know. On the right-hand side here are some pictures of some cells with GFP in them, some fibroblasts and culture. These are uh, some Drosophila fruit fly cells. These are cells uh, from Arabidopsis, the mustard plant. And this is a Purkinje cell. Uh, from, I think, a mouse brain, and you can see how the GFP has gone into all the fine branches of the cell, so we can really get a very nice view of what this cell looks like. Now, I want to tell you a little bit of cell biology because I want to show you a couple movies to give you an idea about what you can see with GFP over time. So, to remind you, when a cell divides, uh, before a cell divides, all the genetic material is inside the nucleus, there's a nuclear envelope that keeps it all inside there, but when the cell divides, the nuclear envelope breaks down, the chromosomes condense, and they come to lie on what's called the mitotic spindle. The spindle is made up of, protein, uh, of structures called microtubules. The mi chromosomes get separated, and finally, the nuclear envelope will reform. I'm going to show you two movies. The first movie is a movie in which one of the microtubule proteins has GFP attached to it. So every time the spindle forms, you're going to be able to see it. The other movie I'm going to show you has, uh, a, has GFP, and attached to GFP is a small polypeptide, a little fragment, but that fragment is enough to make sure that GFP always goes inside the nucleus. That is, if a nucleus is present. If there's no nucleus, of course, it'll go all over the cell, and you'll see that as well. So the first movie is going to be with the microtubules and looking at the spindle. So let me see about getting this. Okay. Now, this is in Drosophila. All the nuclei, there's no cell boundaries, and I hope you can see the spindles form. And this is a time-lapse movie. This is going way faster than happens in the fruit fly. But what I hope you can see as you look at this movie is that you can see that the spindle formation and the division is happening synchronously. 
all of the nuclei are undergoing the same thing. There's something that's making this happen all at the same time. Now, and I should say, this is one of these things that I wish I had done. This is, it was done by a graduate student in Canada, Rosalind Silverman Gavrilla, and she's put these on the American Society for Cell Biology website, and that's where these were taken from. But this other uh, picture here, this movie here, you can see that there's color in it. Now, the color is false color. The convention is the more you have of something, the more you are towards the red end of the rainbow. So red is a lot, and orange is a little less, yellow, green, blue, violet. So that nucleus has very little in it. These have much more. Okay? And uh, let me run this movie so you can see this moving. And you see now it's everywhere in the cell. The nuclei are having there. Now the nuclei are going to reform and the GFP is going to be transported into the nuclei. And then division is going to take place again, so the nucleus has to break, nuclei have to break down, goes all over the cells, and it'll reform, and you can watch that for a little while. Now here, I hope you notice that they're not doing this all at the same time, that there's a wave of these changes happening across the cells, across the embryo. And so the question really is, why is that taking place? Now, I can't actually tell you the answer to that. A friend of mine and I have a debate about it, but as far as I know, he's not done the experiment yet to actually test this. But I hope that this gives you an idea about how wonderful it is, is to, be, to be able to watch things changing and to get ideas, hypotheses, over looking at things changing over time. And you can do this... Uh, and with time lapse, as in these cases. In some cases, it's so fast you don't want to have it time lapse, you just want to take the picture of it. But seeing things change, seeing that dy the dynamic aspects of a biological process is very important. In my own work, we've used GFP in a lot of different ways. We've used GFP to uh, look where genes are expressed. So here they are in all of our six touch cells that I would have been interested in. Here we've made a protein fusion and find that this protein is not made continuously like this, but in this sort of nice dotted pattern along the cells, and we've been studying why that dotted pattern is there. But another thing that you can do, if you take an animal in which you've labeled all the cells that you're interested in, now let's just look at these nerve cells for a second. These are the cell bodies here, and you can see they all have a process that goes forward it, towards the left, which is the anterior part of the animal. We can take this animal and mutate it, give it a chemical to cause mutations, and look at the subsequent progeny, but because we can look at our cells, we can ask, are there any animals that have more cells? Are there any that have less cells? Are there any that have the cells in the wrong place? Are there any in which the nerve processes have not grown out in the right direction or maybe not as extensively or not? And we've found mutants that affect all of those processes. So being able to see something allows you to study it and invites many, many more questions here. In addition, so here we have some mutants, in addition, because we can label the cells, we can also isolate the cells and find the ones that are fluorescent. We know exactly which ones they are, and we've used those to study. So while this has given us a lot of work to do and has allowed us to discover quite a lot, and other people as well, uh, biologists are inherently a greedy bunch. And so uh, once you have green, you want something else. And one of the main people that has changed this, I mean, the first uh, colors were made by this man, Roger Chen, who was the third person to share the prize with us. He made a blue fluorescent protein. And then a wonderful discovery by the Lukianovs and Mikhail Matt in, um, Matz in uh, Russia discovered a coral protein, very much like GFP, that was red. And with the combination of a red fluorescent protein and a green fluorescent protein and being able to mutate the amino acids and changing it, eventually Roger's lab came up with a whole series of different colors that really span the rainbow, all the colors of the spectrum. He got tired of naming these after, uh, by letters, YFP, GFP, that, that was a little boring. He named them after fruits. So I believe, I'm not sure, I, I'm pretty sure this is M. Cherry. Uh, but I believe that this is blueberry, uh, melon, lime, lemon. Um, I don't know if that's orange or carrot, but, uh, and then 
cherry. But having all these colors means that even more experiments can be done. Now, especially having a whole series of colors that you can see that are clear across the spectrum, and given the fact that a lot of people are interested in trying to untangle or unravel, find out about all those many nerve cells in the brain, it's maybe not, so, and given also the fact that scientists don't always come up with the world's greatest names for things, that Jeff Lickman and Josh Thanes decided they were going to look in mouse brains using four of the colors in various combinations to get basically any color they want, and they called their system Brainbow. <laughs> and these are some of the pictures, but they're really spectacular pictures, and they're allowing them and others to actually trace out the circuitry in the brain, which is extremely important in trying to understand how this very complex organ works or beginning to. But there's another thing that's an advantage of the fact of having more than one color, and that's a special property of fluorescent molecules. Let me diagram that here. If you have a protein that is a blue fluorescent protein, that is, it's a protein that's activated by ultraviolet light and gives off blue light, and a yellow fluorescent protein that'll absorb blue light and give off yellow, if the two molecules are far apart from each other, when you shine ultraviolet light on the blue one, or on this whole setup, nothing will happen here. Blue light will be produced. Very little of the blue light will come over here to activate the yellow. So you might get just a tiny bit of yellow, but mainly blue. However, if the molecules are very close to each other, a different process takes place. You get activation by the, blue, the ultraviolet light, but instead of blue light being produced, the activated blue protein transfers its energy to the yellow protein, which in turn now makes yellow light. So you go from a case where it's mainly blue to a case where it's mainly yellow. Now, in this particular example, which was Roger Chen's first example of using this idea, he has this middle part that undergoes a change in its conformation from taking these two things far apart to bring them close together when calcium is added. So he added calcium, he called this a chameleon, and he could bring these two together. So he could, and all of this is encoded by DNA, so you put it in a cell, whatever cell has this, and you shine light, when there's calcium in the cell, you get yellow. When there's little calcium in the cell cytoplasm, you get blue. So you can actually measure how much calcium is present and how the calcium changes. This is a little molecular machine that allows you to measure something within a living cell. Now this process, whereby the energy is transferred to another fluorescent molecule, is called FRET, or Forster Resonance Energy Transfer, and it's been used by people now to make hundreds of these molecular machines. So I'll give you another example. If you're interested in understanding an enzyme that cuts apart proteins, a, called a protease, cuts a protease into two, what you do is you take the part that would be cut and you put it between two of the proteins. Now, because they're close together here, we'll get fret, we'll get mainly yellow. But if the enzyme's around, it's going to cut this. And now we're going to wind up having the blue and the yellow far apart, we're going to get blue. So we can actually measure enzyme activity within a living cell in an organism. And as I say, people have made hundreds of these molecular monitors and used them in various ways. Um, other uses that people have had for GFP, they've used it to investigate disease processes. For example, people have wanted to understand how HIV is transferred from one cell to another. Now, if the standard way we usually teach about viruses is that viruses infect a cell and then the cell explodes and the viruses go everywhere. And if that were the case, then an antibody could sort of latch onto those viruses and maybe get rid of it. But that's not how HIV works. By having HIV that makes GFP, you can see exactly where the virus goes. And what it turns out is that two cells, one infected and one not, basically come up to each other, basically kissing each other, and the virus gets transferred from the inside of one cell into the inside of another. That means we need another strategy to try to foil the, the virus. But it can be seen by using GFP. People have used it to study metastasis in cancer. 
I have a friend, uh, David Sassoon in France, who has been studying, uh, he works on muscle, and he noticed in, in his reading that cancers don't seem to metastasize to muscle. So he wanted to test that. So he took, he used a mouse, and he put a cancer cell in it, cancer cells in it, and he asked, where did the metastases go? And they didn't go to muscle, which now really invites the question, why didn't they? What's different about muscle? What prevents it from being invaded by the cancer cells? So people are using it to study uh, inherited diseases and everything, but that's only a small part. They're also using it to look at various cellular changes and to study basic biological processes in all the areas of, of modern uh, cellular biology. They're also using it to monitor the environment. I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Uh, but I wanted to, I, I've estimated, if you look in PubMed, which is the main database for biology, uh, there's about 30,000 articles that have been written using GFP or one of the other fluorescent proteins or one of these monitors or so on uh, over the last uh, 15, 16 years. Uh, but since most people no longer use GFP in the title or the abstract or the keywords, uh, there's lots of papers that have used it that you don't even know that they are. So I, my estimate is that it's probably about 100,000. And to give you one example, this is one issue of one journal. Uh, January 2010 of the Journal of Cell Biology, and there were 11 articles, research articles, in this particular issue. And this is typical, I have to say. Uh, and there were only two that did not use a fluorescent protein. I'm working on these guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> get a, no, uh, but it, it really is quite remarkable. And you get an idea just by looking at what it was used for of where this is being used. It was used to, people thought they had a part of a protein that sent that protein to a particular place. In order to see if that was the case, they put that part onto a GFP to see where that went, and it went to the right place. They wanted to see where a protein goes, so they, they wanted to mark a cell. They wanted to follow a process, in this, in, in, a, a biological process. They needed to label the cells. They wanted to do, a, they did a genetic experiment. They wanted to make sure that the mice they were making with added genes to it actually had the genes added. So one of the genes they added was GFP. If the mice turned green, they had that one and all the other genes with it. Uh, they wanted to know how, um, in this case, lymphatic tissue was growing. So they made the lymphatic tissue glow green, and they could just watch it grow and see how that changed. They wanted to see if two proteins actually came to the same place. So they labeled them with two different colors so they could see where they were. And finally, in this last paper, they were using a virus to infect some cells, but they wanted to make sure the virus infected, so they had it with GFP. So wherever it infected, those cells would turn green. So lots of different ways. One thing that I sometimes get asked is whether GFP has ever been put into humans. Um, it has been put into human cells and culture. That's for certain. The only evidence I have that it has ever, ever, ever been attempted to put this into human is, is shown here. <laughs> but if you look at the beginning of the Ang Lee movie Hulk, uh, what you find is that the very opening credits do have a little bit about discovering this bioluminescence and the fluorescent protein. And uh, it is that GFP, the green, it comes out, you know, he induces it when he gets angry. So he expresses GFP in his skin. And uh, it turns out that Ang Lee's screenwriter is a man named James Shamas, who is at Columbia University. And I've known James for many years because his daughter and my daughter went to school together. So I, my, after my students forced me to go see the movie, which I actually say I, I did enjoy, uh, I, uh, I went to him and I said, James, how is it that you know about my research? And he said, I don't know anything about your research. But fortunately, there turned out to be a student from MIT that was working on the set, and he was the one that suggested that they put this in the movie. So GFP has made it into the movies. Let me close by saying some of the th lessons I've learned from the research that I've done. So the first is I, seeing what happened with Shimamura and with me and with Chen. Uh, looking at all of us, I, I think you have to say that scientific success comes in, in a lot of different ways. No one would want to do it the way Shimamura did with the heartaches that were entailed in that. And he's also very 
determined person. He sticks on a problem and just keeps working at it. Roger Chen uh, was a, one of the, the people that won when he was in high school. He won, at that time, the Westinghouse Award. Now it's called the Intel Prize. Uh, he was always considered really a brilliant scientist from very early. I don't usually show my grades when I give this talk, so I'm not <laughs> going to talk about me and, and my route here. But uh, there was a time when I thought I was just not going to be in science at all. Uh, I think what probably unites us is the fact that we are passionate about what we're doing and, 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 and very involved in the work that we're doing. I think another lesson that I've learned is that um, many, if not most, discoveries are actually accidental. Not all of us are as lucky as uh, Osamu Shimomura of being able to throw the stuff in the sink and be able to get a wonderful uh, result out of that. Uh, but many things are accidental. The physicist Enrico Fermi has a, a, a wonderful line that goes something on the order of, if you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, you've made a measurement. <laughs> if you do the experiment, it does not confirm your hypothesis, you've made a discovery. <laughs> and there is something, uh, actually a long tradition in, in, in the sciences, or especially in biology, of what's the name sometimes changes. It's either called a Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday morning. Some weekend time period when no one else is in the lab. You sneak in the lab because you have a completely lunatic idea and you want to try it out. You try it out. If it works, you crow about it on Monday. If it doesn't, you just keep your mouth shut and do your regular work. <laughs> But those experiments are extremely important. Trying those crazy ideas out are very important for, for these discoveries. I think uh, what's really good for scientific progress is also ignorance, stubbornness, and a willingness to try. People kept telling us, you're going to need another enzyme for GFP to work. It's not going to work on its own. It's just not going to work. But why not? Let's just try the experiment and see, see if it would work. Uh, and, Shimomura just kept on his work until he got it to work. I think the one thing I really like about, well, I, I like and don't like about the prize. The, pri the Nobel Prize was to three of us, not as collaborators, but as points in a timeline that generated a rather useful reagent. We all contributed to this, as did the thousands of people that have done all these experiments over the time. Uh, and the, the, the bittersweet part is that this could have been maybe another group of three entirely getting this, because so many people contributed. Douglas Prasher, my wife, others that have made all the, the Lukianoffs, the Mikhail Matz, all of these people that have contributed wonderful ideas. And in fact, I think GFP is actually a very good model for what I like to think about scientists and how they interact. Because just as GFP absorbs energy of one wavelength and converts it into a light of another wavelength, we as scientists take in ideas and observations of others, modify them by our own experiments and ideas, and then give them off to others that will then change them again. This cumulative effect of science is extremely important. It's not something that an individual does, but many, many people. And among the many people, the, probably the most important are the postdocs and the students in the lab. When we first got GFP to work and we were first starting to give it away to people, I, I, you know, I, couldn't, keep, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. You know, I told a lot of people. People would call me up and they would say, uh, I, I've heard from my graduate student, or I've heard from my postdoc, that you're working on something called green fluorescent protein. Can I hear what that's about? And I'd tell them, they say, yeah, now I know why they want it. Yes, we want that. Can we get that? And I'd say, sure, we'd send it off. But it was the postdocs and the graduate students that got the heads of the lab sort of off their behinds and on the phones, at least, to get the material. Certainly in my lab, it's the people in the lab that really are the drivers of what goes on. Uh, so that's very important. I think the other thing about the story of GFP that, it, that says to me is that um, we should not just be studying model organisms, the organisms that help us, we think, understand something about human biology, bacteria, certain E. coli, certain other bacteria, yeast. 
nematodes, fruit flies, zebrafish, mice. These are the model organisms, the ones that many people study. We, in fact, should be studying all of life and not just the model organisms. If we kept just to the model organisms, actually, none of this work would be done because when we started, the nematode that I work on, the worm, was not a model organism. It now is. Uh, the jellyfish still is not a model organism. All, I wouldn't be up here saying anything if we just stuck to this incredibly narrow way of looking at life. And there is a lot more out there for us to discover, much, much more, that we're neglecting because we're taking a much too narrow view of what should be studied and what should be funded. And finally, I want to point out that all of this to me started not to study GFP uh, and uh, it, as for something applied, but it certainly has been applied. I actually want to, I, I realize I took out one slide inadvertently. I want to just mention quickly. Uh, it's not just in biology. A man named Bob Burledge had a wonderful idea. Now, the idea has not worked entirely, but the start is, I think, intriguing, and I like his attitude and his ideas about this. He knew that some bacteria had been found that had a rather unusual reaction to the explosive TNT. They could turn on a gene. There was a gene that was turned on in the presence of TNT. It also was turned on in some, with some plant products, so that's probably how it actually had uh, come into being. And he reasoned that if he took the control region of that gene and had it made turn on GFP, that whenever the bacteria were in the presence of the explosive TNT, he'd get green fluorescent bacteria. So if that was the case, he could then, and he had a friend of his do this, had a friend bury in a three meter by five meter plot of land five live landmines. They were disconnected. He's not a stupid person. <laughs> but they still had the explosive in them. He sprayed the bacteria on this plot of land and went back later in, in the night and, with a UV lamp and was able to locate those five landmines. Now, it hasn't been able to be reproduced and this interference with plant proteins makes it very hard to work with. So it's not quite there as really a tool, but the idea of using something like this, applying it to get rid of some, one, of the absolute, one of the absolute worst aspects of warfare that something that kills and maims innocent people well after the combatants have left the area. It's to me quite spectacular as an application. We never were thinking about this when we studied GFP and looked at it as a marker. So let me end with this one plea, which is that basic research is really essential in all of this, and that it is the engine that drives innovation, leading to insights into human diseases and advances in agriculture and industry. And I want to leave you with my favorite quote about uh, what I'm calling non-translational research. And it's a quote by Robert R. Wilson that he gave to a joint session of a committee in Congress that was debating in 1969 whether to fund the building of what became the Fermi Labs in Batavia, Illinois, the biggest particle accelerator in the world until recently when the CERN accelerator went online. Robert Wilson was a physicist. He was the first director of the lab. He designed the lab. His sculptures dot the land around it. He actually, uh, there's a wonderful, it's called Wilson's Tower. It's a wonder, it has a wonderful observation deck, and you go up and you see the whole area. Uh, I was told that they believe that what happened is when, they, when Wilson was drawing the plans for all of this, he hired a helicopter, said, go up, go up. Now, this is the right altitude. This is where I want the observation deck to be. What's your altitude now? And they built the building so the observation <laughs> deck would be up there. Anyway, he was asked by uh, John Pastore, the senator from Rhode Island, who was in favor of the bill, uh, some questions that was going to make it easy for the other congressmen to uh, vote for this rather expensive project. So uh, John Pastore asked uh, Robert Wilson, said, are you, uh, tell me, uh, what's the advantage for the national security of this laboratory, of what you're going to find in this laboratory? And Wilson thought for a moment and said, mm, nothing. And John Pastore kept pushing. 
What, what about the national defense? What, in what respect is this going to be important for the national defense? At which point, Robert Wilson said the following, that it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. I'll come around with the microphone. Just please raise your hand. Yes, sir. I kind of hate to contaminate this uh, talk with a question like this, but I am very curious about it. You know, in the uh, Supreme Court, they're looking at this issue of patents on genes. And this has become a very widely utilized gene. <laughs> And I'm wondering if that issue has ever come up with you or with Columbia University or anybody who was involved with this. So there are different things that one can do with patents. And I think one of the issues that's coming up in all this discussion in the Supreme Court is really a, a question of whether you can patent. It, it is patenting genes, but it's actually patenting information about genes not the using of the gene. So it's, it's, it's really, do you control the information? A lot of the discussion that revolved around the Human Genome Project and the uh, private versus public was that originally the private effort wanted to own the sequence. And so anyone that used that information had to pay some royalty to uh, the company. It didn't come about because the public effort completely swamped it out and had been producing that stuff daily. But uh, with regard to GFP, uh, we never, the, first of all, the, there is never a patent on the sequence. There was a patent that Douglas, Douglas Prasher and I have on the use of GFP for commercial reasons. So if somebody makes money using GFP, then Columbia gets something. Uh, the way the patent was sort of screwed up is I've become a hundred heir from that, but that, I won't go into that. Uh, the, but the issue, uh, but we gave away samples of DNA to people. Uh, we gave away 1,500 samples of the DNA, and then we just got tired of giving it away. I mean, we just got tired of just constantly sending the things out, so we just farmed it out to some other company, to, some other group to, to, to be able to, to do that. So we've always given GFP to researchers for their research, and there's no strings added to any of that. I think there are different ways that things can get patent protection and not. I think that I, I'm very much against the idea of patenting information, where if you want to, if, if you want to know what I know, you have to pay me for it. I, I find that rather difficult. Yes, sir. Is there, are there experiments being considered to study Alzheimer's with GFP? So let me, let me answer that even a little more broadly. Um, the answer is yes, and the answer is also no. I think one of the saddest things that happened as a consequence of the Nobel Prize for me was uh, that the press, some of the press sort of misstated this by saying that uh, GFP could be used to follow where cancer went in the body. And I got an email from a man who said that his wife was in the third bout of cancer, and the doctors had said they did not know where it was in her body, and he kept looking in my papers to find out where this procedure was to find the cancer in his wife. And I had to write him and tell him that what this is, because remember, we're giving the DNA. We're adding that to 
the organism. This is a way of studying the process whereby cancer cells move around, not to study an individual cancer in a, in a person. It's also not to study any uh, disease, even Alzheimer, in people. But it is to look at changes in the brain with different mutations that have been seen in humans, but now are, are put into mice to see how that affects brain development, do they, the same sequelae result from that genetic defect? Can you see that by using GFP? And the answer is yes, and people are doing that a lot. To get back to the cancer uh, issue, people are working extremely hard, not with GFP, but with other fluorescent molecules and other techniques to try to have something so that surgeons could come in if they're trying to remove a tumor, something that would bind a fluorescent protein to the tumor cells so that peop so the surgeon could say, well, it's easy for the surgeon to say, okay, this big lump, I have to get rid of that. But what about the t small things? How do you get those out? If you could have something, a another fluorescent protein with an appropriate protein added to it so that it could uh, bind to those cancer cells, they could get those small bits out as well. And people are working very hard on that. Roger Chen, among others, is working very hard for that. Um, there's so many uh, fluorescent organisms in the ocean. Do they share all the same structure, the, the GFP barrels, or the, any evidence that they have a new type of proteins that needs to be studied? Or so that's a great question. I, I the answer is I I clearly don't know. I have a favorite at the moment. It turns out, I, I only found out about this uh, ab about a month ago. It turns out that when people want to find scorpions in the American Southwest, they, take, they go out at night and they take handheld UV lamps because scorpions have a blue fluorescence. And I'm wondering whether that, in fact, might be a derivative of GFP. I should also tell you that everyone in this audience has something that looks very much like GFP in them already. Uh, there's an extracellular matrix protein that is a protein outside of the cell called nitrogen, and its structure is surprisingly similar to the structure that I showed with GFP. And Jim Remington at the University of Oregon has estimated that you only need four amino acid changes in nitrogen, and it becomes fluorescence. I don't, it's fluorescent. I don't think anyone's tested that yet. But uh, it's interesting because you start thinking about the evolutionary uh, route that produced GFP and how that changed. And there are people that are studying that as well. Uh, but there, I, I'm sure there are other organisms. The coral fluorescent proteins are, were similar enough so that DNA probes from GFP could be used to pull them out but their sequences and, and, and even some of their structure are variants. They're not absolutely identical. So there may very well be other things out there. But so far that I know of, no one has found anything that's, that's different. Although there's a lot of people doing a lot more scuba diving to find the unusual things that they might be able to look at. Any more questions? Oh, we have time for one more back here. Uh, what's the use of JFP in uh, jellyfish? What does he use it for? <laughs> yeah, no one knows actually. <laughs> That's one of the so we, we know how to use it in all the other cells. But so it, there's an interesting finding. There are lots of bioluminescent jellyfish. Now jellyfish live at different depths in the sea. The ones that are at the surface, uh, their bioluminescence with a corin and they have GFP they produce green light, because you can see green light at the surface. If you go deep in the, in the sea, you can't see any color but blue. And so they don't have the GFP. So they don't seem to make it, or they've lost it. So different species of jellyfish. But that doesn't actually explain why the ones at the surface are like that. Why aren't they all blue? I mean, you could see blue just as easily at the top. And no one's really sure. I'm going to give you one idea. Uh, but it's not a great one, but it's, uh, it's one that, that, that was presented. Actually, I thought it was pretty clever. Was, I, originally, uh, uh, this is Shimamura's idea, and that is that if you shine light on GFP, so a photon of light comes in, you can ask, how many photons of light come out? And it's about 
So that's a pretty efficient process. One goes in, 0.9 goes out. You just lose a little bit. That's called the quantum efficiency. The quantum efficiency for a quorin that is generating light, so a chemical reaction then leading to light being produced, it's not really one light in, one light, one photon in, one photon coming out, but they can calculate how many photons should be made from the chemical reaction that takes place, and the efficiency there is only 0.1. It's only 10% instead of 90%. So it's not, so the making of light is not very efficient. Well, remember I showed the fret picture where the two things are close together? Well, if a quorin and GFP are really close together, a quorin doesn't make any light. It transfers the energy, just like in fret, over to the GFP, and you get only green light coming out. You don't get blue and green. You just have them both close together. And the overall efficiency of that process goes up from making light at 10% to now making light at 30%. So it may have evolved to be a more efficient light producer. There are some other ideas that people have, but no one that may have been involved in some sort of oxidation reaction and so on. But no one really knows why it's there. And no one knows why the jellyfish make light in the first place. You know, some organisms, like fireflies, uh, use it for mating, attracting mates. There's some crustaceans that do that as well. Some organisms use it as a startle response. Some of them use it to attract prey. No one has any idea, as far as I know, about what the jellyfish are using it for. Something else to study. Dr. Chelfi, I, I, I lied. There's, there's one more question. I, I was promised it was a concise question. Yes. I was wondering about this uh, drug delivery system, labeling the cells, uh, malignant cells or otherwise, in uh, disease process and delivering the medicine through that. Uh, so we are doing some labeling of the cells and delivering. And so one, if, 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 uh, so one can test things not using GFP, okay? So you, you wouldn't want to take a cancer cell and put it into someone and say, okay, I want to know where it goes, right? Because you don't want to put it in the person. So, uh, but you're bringing up an interesting question. So one of, the, one of the things that people have been thinking about a lot in the last 20 or so years is some sort of gene therapy, where you have an inherited disease and you want to get it a, a particular, the normal copy of the gene into the cells, cystic fibrosis, for example, muscular dystrophy, other diseases of this type, where we might be able to actually correct the, the disease. People have a very good virus that they're studying now as a way of getting that DNA into the proper cells. It's called, I think, adeno-associated virus, AAV. Now, if you want to know if this is useful, one of the ways, not in people, but maybe as you go through the line of saying, did it work in mice? Does it work in uh, you know, other mammals? Does it work in primates? Can we, you know, can we actually test it? One way to test it is you know that it's worked. It's brought in a gene. If it can bring in the gene for GFP, because you can see the GFP. So it can be used as a tool to monitor that. I am... I, I, I'm not close enough to what people are deciding about people, but I sort of think they're not going to test it by seeing if GFP goes into people. I just don't think, I think they would probably try to put the gene they want in and just see if it worked after it had worked in all the other systems. Um, so, I, again, I can't really imagine people using GFP in that way, but my imagination may be sort of narrowed. I, I'm sure there's somebody out there that wants to have a green fluorescent tattoo. I, you know, and every, every, you know, it used to be at the, in the first couple of years of GFP, just around March, I get a phone call in the lab and somebody would say that they had this great idea. I think it was because St. Patrick's Day. They wanted to make green fluorescent yeast and then make beer from them. And that was, <laughs> there was going to be green fluorescent beer. And it, it also never worked, but uh, the, or, or the, it never, they never proceeded on that. I'm happy to say. Thank you, Dr. Chalfie.
I think uh, it, it was the first question that asked about the intellectual property rights and patent protection of scientific discoveries. That is going to be the topic of next week's lecture. It's going to be on Wednesday, May 4th, with Nobel laureate Robert Laughlin. There are still seats available, so please uh, check out lindahall.org for your tickets. Thank you for attending tonight's lecture, and good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Black reaction explained to you. The guy at Princeton who cooked up.